Okay, so um, in terms of then just taking you through the next part of this journey that I would like to uh, remind and refresh us on. So, yeah, something's changed in the air was my subject for yesterday. I'm going to continue that little discussion and then hopefully Colin will pose some questions. So reminding you of the hashtags, we've got uh, a few things going on today, uh, which maybe you want to capture. We'd be happy for you to capture screens. Um, and as long as you uh, put the hashtags alongside that, that would be even better if you put it on social media so we get a bit of coverage. The, the left-hand picture, again, is just a reminder that we're just thinking about how do we affect the change that we need to, that the next generations will benefit from the, be the, the brilliant part of our technology that allows us to meet and connect and be part of this safe environment of aviation. You know, we need to think about not just for now, but for the future. But if we don't start d delivering now, we'll miss out on that future. So a bit about me, you, you know me as maybe uh, part of uh, aerospace. I've worked in BA Systems, Rolls-Royce, and uh, GKM most recently, largely working in technology around sustainability and also in Industry 4. Um, you can uh, find out a little bit more about what I've been up to, but what I'm going to talk a bit about today after we've talked about the supply side, we've talked about the demand side, really I want to make sure that we're starting to prepare ourselves for day three and the call to action. And how we go about that typically is to think about all well, what is sustainable aviation teaching us and how are we going to accelerate innovation? And then really putting that into perspective of what you personally can do. So from a perspective of that sustainable aviation need, um, we heard yesterday, I think, from EDF and uh, we also will hear from um, EasyJet. Um, and we've heard from Roland Berger that the call to action is coming from the youth. Uh, and uh, this lady, Greta Thunberg, um, has most recently you know, really pushed the aviation sector to think a bit differently. Um, and frankly, I think she's uh, motivated a large number of people, including my children, and I hope some of yours, to start really questioning what we're doing personally, professionally in this industry. Are we really listening to the scientists? And if you think about the last year of the pandemic, we've had to listen to the scientists more than ever. Um, this statement was made back in 2019, and my kids went to see Greta Thunberg last year in the middle of... Um, January, actually, so about this time last year, and uh, we realised that there's something profound going on. And I think Roland Berger's uh, Robert Thompson yesterday said one of the causes of why hydrogen now and why it's different is because of that public perception and public need, um, not just the technology being ready, um, but the real desire to make a real difference in this world. So let's just talk about what we mean by that. Yeah, so we do do know this, and. Um, Red Hawkins here of Reading University published uh, a, a lovely paper, which was um, also supported by an app, which if you're interested, just uh, hashtag show your stripes. And what he basically did is point out in September 2019 that all this climate strike, uh, all of these uh, uh, global actions that are taking place are largely because we've been ignoring the facts. If you look at that chart, the blues are where cooling has been happening since uh, over 100 years ago, but you take the last 20 years, global warming is increasingly hitting us in our faces. And we've been kind of putting it slightly to the back end of our thinking in terms of what we should be doing as an aerospace and aviation sector. Um, and I guess the motivation for all of us is to think hard about, you know, what is it that we can do? I mean, if we don't do anything, there are consequences. And I guess that the next thing we can talk to in, in, in these slides now, uh, so I get my computer to work, um, is that we've got a lot of opportunity. And um, so let's talk about the opportunity today. Um, if we take the risks and turn them into uh, opportunities, I like to look at the World Economic Forum risks. And if you think about it, and now <laughs> I look at this in a different way today than I did even this time last year, you know, we are looking there at the top 10 risks that were highlighted by uh, the World Economic Forum ahead of Davos 2020, which was about this time last year. Extreme weather events, failure of climate change, mitigation, adaption, natural disasters, man-made environmental disasters, biodiversity and loss, and eco ecosystem collapse. Um, you know what? They are all things that we actually contribute to in some shape or form. So we have to do something because the, the, the spotlight is on, of the top 10, something that we can do something about in our sector. Um, the other thing that you can look at from that perspective is, and if we can catch up with the, the internet, um, what the impact is. And of course, 
the one thing that I hadn't spotted until we, we, I re-looked at this set of slides is down the bottom there, you know, impact of spread of infectious diseases was put down at number 10. Um, on our industry, I think it could be number one today. And, uh, you know, but but really, is climate change actually more important than COVID and the effect that it could have on our travel system, our way of living and our livelihoods in terms of connecting people? I think it is. And I think that the fact that we, we um, look at this and think about the panic and the pandemic, the response and call to action that we've achieved with so much science and technology um, to really mitigate that impact of number 10, think about all that energy, enthusiasm and co collaboration that we could put into the other five. And I just let you pause and think about what, you know, we should be doing differently, learning from the lessons of COVID collaboration, you know, even things like the ventilator challenge. Um, maybe there's more to be gained by collaborating than ever before. And I think that one of the messages that we're going to hear today is, you know, there's no one silver bullet. I'm sure we're going to hear that multiple times. And I hope we're also going to hear about how how these companies want our help in the supply chain and need our help. So, yes, we've heard this picture. We've seen this picture. Climate change is real. And anyone's had the um, chance to look at the growth in aviation. Yes, we've got a blip and it will probably recorrect from even this chart. But if we continue to produce CO2 at the rate that we are on current platforms, then we will never meet the 2050 goals to reduce from 2005 uh, metrics by 50 percent and that's not acceptable the opportunity is really to think about this in a number of ways so firstly what can technology do to bring that down so we've already seen great advances since 2005 in fuel efficiencies of aircraft so if you're airbus or rolls royce or anyone else on this call today from um, current sectors, you all know that the aircraft of 20 years ago um, have improved significantly to today. We're doing engine upgrades and uh, performance improvement plans on every single engine. And that's made a massive contribution um, to the, the way in which aviation's being able to hold a little bit steady in terms of that growth in CO2. But that's not enough. And it's certainly not enough uh, when we start looking at our travel, um, you know, when we travel on wide body aircraft, we contribute to over 60 percent of the CO2. But when we travel on a single R, there's still a lot of flights on single R, but we need to tackle that. So we do need to look at radical options. And today uh, you could call hydrogen a radical option. But for me, it's probably one of those parts of the mix that's not that difficult to see that it could be achieved. I think we always put in you know, challenges about safety. Uh, and concerns about how to get the logistics to the, um, the floor plate of an aircraft on an apron. But if we don't do something, the economic uh, measures, which include curtailing flights or higher taxation that increases ticket prices, um, will also be a part of the challenge that we're going to have to face up to. So when we start, start looking ahead, we need to do something now. Um, that picture shows that we need to start doing something really quite quickly. And i um, really pleased to be able to sort of talk about how we can accelerate that. I'll come on to Eric's question, which is about, you know, how can uh, climate change and pandemics be linked in a moment? Um, so we will, why hydrogen? Why now? We've heard a bit about that over the course of the day. Yesterday, um, the cost of hydrogen is coming down and will be less than half, if not that of um, where it is today. And green hydrogen I'm talking about, because I think, we do see that um, the, the start of any journey, a bit like electric, we go hybrid electric, we take on board the fact that we don't get all the benefits from in, on day one. Um, but we do think that we'll see, you know, from brown to green, hydrogen, you know, that conversion, electrolysis costs coming down. We heard about a 50% reduction in electrolysis costs. Uh, we've heard about, you know, maybe nuclear being beaten in terms of its costs of supply of uh, uh, electricity to the grid. Uh, by renewables last year in terms of the way forward. Obviously, we need large amounts more renewables to feed the the many demands that are going to be hitting us, whether it be electric vehicles or buses or trains. But we need to think about you know the mix and where hydrogen sits in that. And we can talk about hydrogen. Yes, it's safe. And, and many people can't believe that that safety uh, has been proven. But yes, it has. NASA's been uh, flying hydrogen for many years and project suntan was one of those in this in the 60s and pratt and whitney actually designed their engine their gas turbine with hydrogen in, in the combustor 
So we know that hydrogen works. We've seen the Russians fly a two pull off uh, 148, I think it is, 149. And they've been able to demonstrate that this is absolutely feasible. Whilst I say it's absolutely feasible, we don't shy away from the challenges. There's you know, huge storage challenges with hydrogen in terms of the volumetrics and the, you know, the, the density. The gravimetric density, on the other hand, is far better than that of kerosene. So whilst we trade one um, area, we get a benefit in the other. So could we see longer, slimmer aircraft that have um, a large uh, hydrogen tank in them, replacing some of the seats? I think most likely. Um, but, you know, can it be achieved? I've been doing some studies with Embraer and uh, and thinking about that with uh, Telft University and even conversion of existing aircraft is really on the cards. You've got companies like uh, Universal Hydrogen who haven't been able to make it here today. They're over in Los Angeles. They are building a demonstrator right now on a Dash 8. Uh, we can see that that will fly by 2023 uh, with plug power. You know, we haven't got an equivalent yet of that sort of scale in the UK. And I think that that's one of our challenges to take all this great work that's going on, the low TRLs, um, TRL level six and below to the skies and get to TRL nine far faster. So one of my challenges for everyone today is how do we do that? Um, we need to obviously think back. We we looked at things like biofuels in the past. We recognize that could be part of the mix and SAF. Um, but I don't think that's the only part of where hydrogen is needed. We need to think about the context of all elements of what we can do. We've heard about blade in the past. You know, with a program now where we may not have fuel in that wing, does that mean that we can do something different with laminar flow? Because one of the challenges of laminar flow has been how do you actually keep the wing um, an aerodynamic clean profile? Perhaps now we've got that, um, that, that thinner section of a wing. We've got more flexibility to use laminar flow. We can do something different. So what hydrogen unlocks is potentially all these things we've had in our store cupboard um, and been working on for many years. And I think one of the challenges to us now is how do we pick and choose? Um, we've got great work going on um, in the ATI, as, as Colin's pointed out, on Fly Zero. And I'm sure they're looking at all ways and means to reduce um, the effects of um, both the greenhouse gases from a technology perspective using all manners of uh, technology. So you know, boundary layer ingestion. I uh, don't know how many people have looked at this before. Um, but it has been on some occasions ruled out by certain OEMs. But now I think it's coming back. And why? Because when you start being able to do distributed propulsion and hydrogen enables electric hybrid, um, then we can see a different way to ingest the boundary layer and we potentially reuse that boundary layer effect to reduce the drag. And so we've got multiple um, uh, different technologies that begin to get unlocked due to hydrogen. And we can reconfigure the platform of the aircraft and, and with that, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more from Airbus today about some of the challenges um, that they've got to work through. They've got three concepts from the Zero E program, and some of that detail should be uh, in the uh, the handouts that you can pick up on. We've also got things that I'm talking to EasyJet and others about. You know, are there ways and means to use air traffic control where we can put formation flying in place? And because we're now in the nature of thinking about collaboration, do airlines actually collaborate to uh, achieve their Corsair um, targets and reduce the amount of um, carbon levy that they need to be paying into? Because they could. They could all benefit by working together in a collaborative way. We know the flying geese formation story, of which, which you can see on the screen here. But, you know, are there other things that come from actually moving to a new set of technologies, and a new way to collaborate in our industry that we hadn't thought about before? And then just a bit more food for thought as we go into the, the future, you know, are we going to be seeing new ways in which we're going to be able to deliver um, the performance benefits from all of this technology coming together as an overall system? And my thoughts are here, we need to accelerate innovation. And I, and I sit here and I work with the ATI Boeing Accelerator, which I know many of you are aware of. Uh, Susan Schofield is a sponsor from GKN and I believe from Rolls-Royce. We've got team now alongside Boeing and Nicola and the team, Nicola Bates and the team there uh, working with all of the ATI and now 10 startups. And what we've learned from that experience is that they are really able to move at a pace and they really can deliver us from a different sort of perspective, gains in terms of delivering technology that will have an impact. So what do we learn from the ways of working of a startup? Well, 
quite a lot, actually. And I think the sprint mentality that we see in those startups, how they can iterate really quickly, learn and fail, but then continue to learn and grow. Um, we need to take some of that on board. And um, I think one of the challenges that we have as an industry is we don't like failure sometimes because that's seen as a negative. But actually, if we build on the failure and understand the lessons learned and share those, then what has been science fiction becomes science fact. Um, and today, I think, you know, we've seen announcements yesterday of future flight. And again, some great news stories, one which I want to pick up on. Uh, I've seen that, you know, we've got Heathrow leading a, a team called Napkin, which I know Rolls and GKN and a number of others, Cranfield, uh, are all involved in. And that's about looking at the whole aviation system to make sure that we accelerate to deliver us the goals of a sustainable aviation sector. So we're going to talk a bit more about hybrid power today. Um, I think one of the challenging things that we've got to think about is, is this the function of you know hybrid gas turbines with fuel cells? We talked a bit about that yesterday. Is there a function of more hybrid electric in this mix? Is there a function of maybe something else like ammonia in the mix with hydrogen um, being a, a good way to carry the hydrogen or even um, combust it? Uh, so one of the thoughts that I've been thinking about for today is can we keep our minds open? You know, how do we collaborate to make sure that we take all these great test beds? And I think Charles Burke has sort of said, you know, it's good to have a demonstrator, but what's better is to actually go into production because it forces you to make some really different decisions. So one of the challenges for the Southwest and what we're trying to do through WEF is say, right, if we're in the midst of this journey towards more electric, more hybrid electric, more hydrogen electric, Where's the demonstrator? And are there potential route maps quite quickly to go beyond the demonstrator into flying some vehicles that are going to be part of the fleet? And I know that one of the, uh, the conversations that might be happening in the background, we sometimes forget we've got a great defence industry on our doorstep. Um, we've got Simon Bollum, a big advocate of sustainability at the top of DENS here in Abbey Wood. Um, you know, there's some conversations that I know are happening. Maybe we could do something with the Ministry of Defence on this area as well. There's not just what we've been thinking around the, the commercial sector. So what's going to change? What's going to help us accelerate? Well, data is becoming more and more available, more accessible, and we can use some of that data to help us. And I'll give you an example. Working with a company called Satavia, who have already built a contrail model, um, they're looking at how to redesignate aircraft in the sky to avoid contrails. Using big data sources, they've clustered together all of the compute power of uh, Microsoft over the Christmas break. They pulled all of their uh, Azure servers together, and they've computed where contrails are going to exist. On a daily basis, they can give an hour-by-hour -hour prediction of how to avoid contrails. The radiative force of, of, of contrails could be as much as 7% of today's uh, um, effect from aviation. So we could eliminate potentially 7% of the radiated forces associated with aerospace and aviation by using data. And I finish with a slide that hopefully motivates in, in, on the how before we then go to questions and quickly then introduce uh, Airbus as we set up for the next session with Jackie. Um, I think we need to start thinking about policy and strategy. Um, that's really what Ben Harrop tomorrow will be talking to us about on day three. We've talked a bit about accelerating research, some great examples of that going on. And I think we also could start talking about really, you know, what can we do to collaborate differently and how are we going to do that? You know, we've got the models of the ventilator challenge, which we wouldn't have had this time last year, you know, working together, finding new ways, tackling challenges, but really bringing together demonstrators at um, ventilator pace. And I think for me, one of the things that I'm doing to, to promote I guess that that pace and agility of design and development is I'm working with a little company called My Mars Fit, where I've been able to use the industry foreknowledge I've had to help the NHS receive masks that um, are really um, well fitting PPE for the future. So they can scan their faces using a mobile app and the next day using additive manufacturing, they'll have a mask that fits them. So that's just a little background um, before we go into our, our session with Airbus. So, Colin, any questions? I think we lost Colin. So if um, if everyone's happy, we are all settled in. I'm going to just uh, switch over to the other session and um, we'll look forward to seeing you with Jackie in a moment. Thank you.